about not its status, but reminding people kind of its background and where this idea came from. So um, I'm, I'd like to convince everyone that prompt optical emission, the rise phase of the optical light curve, I'm not talking about the afterglow, I'm not talking about a little bit of trailing off at the end, I'm talking about the rise phase, has a lot of interesting um, physics in it and touches on interesting topics. And this is what you could do if you could respond fast enough to catch this initial optical rise. Um, well, um, we think that you can, uh, using simple assumptions, you can, from Molinari et al, 2007, you can get kind of an estimate of the bulk Lorentz factor just by looking at the time of rise. And as you can see in here, you just, okay, look at the rise time and you get a optical, you get a bulk Lorentz factor. And of course, looking in this, in this thing, you end up um, with the kind of Fermi-like factors of 1,000 um, at 10 seconds and you can get, you know, faster or slower. Um, um, for, uh, and for, bulk, for, for a BLF of about 1,000, like the Fermi kinds of, of values, you need to respond faster than 10 seconds. Again, that's why we have this, this very fast response system. Um, you can identify if the origin of the prompt optical emission is internal shock or not by looking at, does it look like a gamma ray versus is it this very quick thing, or does it look like a, this smooth, nice thing that comes up like that? Some of them we've seen are, are look, look like either one so far. Um, and you must have to be much faster response with much faster time resolution than we have now to do this. Um, I want to remind you that um, there's, there, if you had a big sample of uh, optical and uh, gamma rays uh, in prompt, you could do all kinds of interesting things with it, all kinds of interesting correlations. Um, and as far as whether they correlate or not, there are both examples and counterexamples. And here's, so there's this very nice example of 04-1219. Here is a 9901-23, uh -uh, no way. No, couldn't, couldn't correlate. And, and some kind of intermediate case for the naked eye burst. Um, uh, I, think, I think I briefly mentioned this in the previous talk. Um, you can think of doing multi-measurement, messenger measurements, what they call this. Um, look in the correlation decay um, of, uh, okay, now you have the gamma ray bursts, and now you, gamma and X and optical, okay, and then you might even have gravitational waves and neutrinos for the same event. That would be really cool. Um, you can uh, look at GR alternative models by looking at this enormous, enormous spread in energy from an EV to, to MEV. Um, and have a, have a great um, lever arm there in energy. Um, and these time scales can be potentially very short and you need faster response than you have already. I think you've seen this, I'm gonna skip over this. Um, so we've been hoping there's gonna be a GRB luminosity calibration for years and nothing has really come of this. Um, it, so there was an interesting paper, um, Panatescu and Vistrand, 2008, which is a paper I love to refer to because it sort of gathered all the fastest light curves and it has dozens and dozens and dozens of them. And you realize most of them do not catch the rise. Uh, but one of the things, interesting things they did was they plotted um, a luminosity and rise time correlation. And you say, and you look at this and you go, wow, this is great. We should, we should follow up on that. We should you know, bet our scientific reputations on that. Well, before you bet your scientific reputation on that, be careful because in the same paper, they have these many, many light curves which just don't have the rise time. So they plotted, you know, four or five on, on that, but, there's, but the sample is 60, or there's something fishy going on. So we just, so I, I wouldn't bet my reputation on this, but I would say it's interesting enough that I'd love to have the data to look at that correlation and see if there's anything really there. Right, um, so most of the rises are unknown. You just need more data at earlier times. And, this, and the UFO project is all about just getting there faster with the optical. So um, again, Swift has this um, really this cliff at at uh, at 60 seconds, and and more like it's more typical is 100 seconds. You're missing a lot of these phenomena. How will we ever get a great sample of these rise times if we don't make an instrument for it? And that's what UFO is supposed to do. Um, um, I don't want to minimize ground-based telescopes. First of all, we had a very nice talk today about some uh, prompt detections um, from Master, and I wanted to show you some of the interesting ones from. Uh, from ROTC that I have, um, which shows, okay, a smooth optical here, but notice that they failed to catch the rise. Even if with response as fast as 10 seconds, they failed to catch the rise. Again, failing to catch the rise. Um, and wouldn't you love to know the true distribution of these rise times? Okay. Um, so um, after six, now seven years of SWIFT, um, there are a few detections from from uh, ground base of this of this of this uh, of this um, of this um, prompt optical, 
we have one of these really fantastic cases, but it's one in seven years. That's not an existence proof. It's kind of a proof that you gotta do something else, you're never gonna get there. You're never gonna get enough data to really, really move forward on this. Um, Swift is not gonna be there forever. We need a faster, faster system for a game-changing kind of, kind of uh, progress on this. So how do you respond faster? Okay, so here's, here's the Swift satellite. It's pointing over here, but it has an extremely wide field camera. Camera burst is over there, and it says, okay, I'll go. And I'll go tick, 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 tick. And it has to move this entire mass of satellite, tick, 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 over until it can finally point at the gamma ray burst. So what is the sense, however, in moving this whole giant spacecraft? Why not just move the mirror? Uh, what's the speed? How many degrees can you move? Uh, Swift? Okay. I think the, the right answer to that is, I don't care what the engineers say, it's, it's the histogram I just showed you of response times. It's, it has a peak around 100 seconds, and then it falls off completely to zero by 60 seconds. The speed of the... the speed of Swift, yeah. 100 seconds of what? I mean, how many degrees can you move per, per hour? Okay, so, I mean, again, um, again, I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. All I know is, is from the time that the gamma ray burst triggers, to the time that you detect something, typically takes 100 seconds and is almost never past, almost never faster than 60 seconds. But everything interesting is faster than 60 seconds. No, I know, I totally agree, but if you compare with HST. Yes, compared with HST, it's much faster. Um, and again, I don't, I don't mean to minimize the, you know, the great job of making Swift pretty Swift, but it could be faster. Um, so yeah, you have to rotate the whole, the whole spacecraft. And if you want to respond faster, instead of steering a whole spacecraft, why not just steer a beam? Why not just stick a mirror in front of a telescope, which is much faster, and which is what we've done. Um, the way I got into this whole business was the, um, our um, partners at uh, IHWA, Women's <coughs> University in Seoul, which you'll see me write down as things like IHWA or, or MEMS or RCMST. Um, it's all the same people. It's Il Park's lab at IHWA have these um, micromirrors, and these micromirror arrays are fabricated just like semiconductor devices are fabricated, and um, they're very small. Um, these are um, half millimeter um, size array, sized mirror segments here, um, and what's different about these from commercial MEMS devices is that they have extremely large throws. Plus and minus 50 degrees is no problem, okay? They, are, they operate in milliseconds, which is, which is very exciting for trying to steer a beam. Uh, and and uh, you can imagine putting a mosaic in of, of these devices in front of a telescope and steering the beam that way. Um, the turns out that the limiting factor is the uniformity of manufacture. It turns out that that's worse than the um, diffraction limit for these little tiles. The problem is, is they don't all point quite exactly in the same place. So when, so when we looked at these in tests, we found that this was spreading out the PSF as much as two arc minutes. So as George mentioned last night, we had an idea where we would have, um, where, where we would have a, a large plane of these on a platform that rotates. We might try to get ultra-fast prompt uh, response by combining a kind of, kind of mem steering where the little, each little element would, would move over in a millisecond, and then you turn the power off. They do go f optically flat when the power's off, and then move the platform in, in, on the seconds time scale. It turned out that that just didn't work so well in, on the actual UFO Pathfinder, we won't be using these at all. We'll be using standard mirror technology. Um, I think I just sort of mentioned all of this. Just one minute question. They, they can flip on the two, the two axes. Two axes, more than plus minus 50 degrees. They're really, really something. And that's what's different from ours compared to commercial ones. Commercial ones typically are made for things like adaptive optics. Uh, corrections, and they have a, they have, they're more complicated. They have a piston mode as well, but usually their throw is very tiny. And the other kind of MEMS mirrors, of course, are the kinds of projectors, and they're one-dimensional on-off devices. They're not carefully steered. Um, so um, here's our little um, schematic of the UFO Pathfinder. It's a tiny, tiny instrument. It's only about, uh, just over 20 kilograms. I'm sure we cheated and got a little bit above that. Um, only about 10 watts, I'm sure, again, we cheated, got a little above that, but order of magnitude. It's gonna be mounted on the Lomonosov uh, instrument platform up here um, with um, BDRG Shuck and all of the instruments from our uh, partners here at MSU and, and SINP. Um, it has a coded mass camera, just like kind of a micro Swift. It has um, a, a beam steering mirror and an optical uh, path goes out that 
um, sun shield there. There's some electronics, the detector plane, uh, the primary mirror, um, our ICCD detector, and our beam steering mirror. I, I did, one, one of the points that I didn't really make in my last talk was that um, this is, it's, it has the coated mask and the optical follow-up kind of like a micro Swift, but one thing that's very much missing compared to Swift is it doesn't have an X-ray, a pointed X-ray telescope. So Swift can do really, really cool things like just using the X-ray telescope, looking at the afterglow, it can give you arc second positions. And that's, that's amazing and wonderful. And, and you can go do stuff with galaxies even though you never got an optical signal. However, um, for this kind of small, fast, quick, cheap idea, it's still, I think, worth considering uh, the concept that you just go after the bursts that have a bright counterpart. Okay, when you go, just go after the bursts with a bright counterpart, kind of like, um, kind of like the, uh, our friend's um, a scheme here, they're bright, and you can take spectra of them, and you can keep looking at the afterglow, and okay. So there's lots you can do with them. So that's, that's one, one nice selection of, the, of it. Uh, so um, here is the only part of the talk that has the actual update that I'm supposed to be giving. Um, here are some pictures of the actual devices. So you'll see this hopper here is passive multi-layer shielding. And, that's, and down here is the detector plane for the X-ray detector. So again, some gamma ray burst goes off. The photons come in here. This is a shadow mask. It casts a shadow on the detector plane by looking at, okay, just like any shadow, the light source goes over there and the shadow goes over here. Light source goes over there, shadow goes over there. Just like any shadow, you can tell where the source is by, by deconvolving the actual pattern on the detector. This is the actual, what's called the SMT, or the Slewing Mirror Telescope. This is the actual beam steering mirror here. Um, the hood is up. This would normally be in a position where we fold it down over, and uh, the light comes in through the sun shield there. Um, so this is our flight model, um, and, um, and this is a little base plate that's bolted onto the instrument platform. Um, here you can see we're doing a little test of, with parallel light in the actual SMT and the steering mirror. And right now the UFO is at ISTRA, the undergoing tests um, with integration with an interface with other instruments. Um, so this is our beam steering mirror right here. And um, what is limiting is uh, when you're talking about things in the one second slew range, the limit is, is not really is not, is not really how fast it takes to get there, but rather how, takes, how fast it takes to settle. So if you look at our data here and the settling times, and you'd see we get down to the arc second range around 300, 400 um, milliseconds. So our fastest response will probably be around 400 milliseconds and up to about a second. Um, we have a very nice mask made by our collaborators at the University of Valencia. And um, again, this just shows a little bit more of a cutaway, the mask up here, the hopper and shielding here, the detector plane here, the electronics underneath. Um, our mask is tungsten. We have a very unusual detector. Um, our detector is made, is read out by MAPMTs. And here we have YSO crystals. The reason we ended up with this is we had a very, very short time to, to do this project. We tried to um, get good electronics for uh, CZT detectors, and we were unable to do this in the time frame necessary. However, um, we um, have connections to the Gem Uso collaboration. We were able to have their ASICs to read out all these MAPMTs. And so that's, that's the motivation behind this very non-standard kind of detector. Um, this is our UFO digital board for readout. And this is uh, one of our spectra. Yes? This is a space rock. It's made in Paris. I think so, yes. I think so, yes. Um, these are numbers that are mainly for me in case anybody asks any questions. But um, some of the things I want to point out, it's only 200 square centimeters, very tiny. Uh, and um, and uh, we have 48 by 48 channels. Uh, here, is, um, here, is, here we are in Istra. That's Vasily, that's Nikolai Vedenkin, who is, who is here from. This evening, and Vasily was here yesterday. And, uh, and they're, they're from MSU, and they're in, in here um, working on it, yeah, testing this. 
Um, the, SMT, the SMT instruments is now being tested at ISTRO. This is some uh, multi-layer insulation, and that's Nikolai again working with one of our people um, from Korea, from the RCMST. Um, this is an electronics box for SMT. Uh, here's our mirror, you can see that, okay. And um, some of the details of space flight, we're doing things like, like stuffing epoxy on all these boxes, getting them ready for space flight. And here we are working at the ISTRA facility. Here's our expert team, um, which includes Goon, Sumin, Era, and Jiyun. Um, here checking the power boards. We spent a lot of time at the facility, uh, assembly facility in Istra, retesting, retesting, assembling, and so forth. Um, I hope that some of our tests are a little bit more sophisticated than this, but here's how we check the, re re the, re the repeatability of our pointing uh, for the moment, and getting it down to 10 arc minutes. Our, the idea of our, of our, um, our uh, um, mirror is not so much to point so precisely. We have a, we have a field that's slightly larger than um, we, have, we, have a, we, have a, we have a 15 arc minute field for our camera. We don't want to point to a single pixel accuracy. Um, to update our schedule, in about two weeks, we'll be doing the um, flight model bus interface input control test. In early July, we'll actually attach the whole thing to the payload frame of the spacecraft. Um, we'll do integration tests um, between um, the BDRG instrument, which we just, just heard the talk about, and uh, an SMT to try and be able to trigger off of BDRG triggers. Um, this is, um, again, um, our field is too small to get uh, a, a very large yield from BDRG, but what if you have a, like a failure of UBAT? It's still a nice thing to have. Um, and also, um, it would be nice to have um, uh, data from BDRG and shock and SMT all at the same place and time. Um, and then in July, we'll be delivering this thing to VDM will be, um, I'm not sure when the cross calibration, final cross calibration is scheduled, if that's a kind of a question mark for me. And our best launch estimate now is 2013 April. Uh, we want to, when we're done with UFO, we want to sort of go beyond this and want to have um, a next generation uh, mission with a lot more area. We want to sort of attack some of the problems that we, that I talked about this morning. And um, I think I went over most of this. So I'm not going to dwell too long on any of these. Stop me if you have any questions. I just want to remind you that it's like, again, sort of the same mini swift idea, um, a coded mass camera. Now we're trying to get up to 1,000 square centimeters, which we think we can fit in 120 kilograms uh, in a next generation mission. Um, again, we have um, a steering mirror. Um, on a 30 centimeter telescope to try and get up to the same aperture size as SWIFT. Um, and we want to use this um, dichroic to have both an optical and an infrared camera on the same, at, at taking um, images at the same time. This is based on a kind of typical a Teledyne sensor with a nice clever uh, Leo stop and a Narcissus baffle design and, um, and a pretty standard um, CCD camera. Um, again, I, I, I'm excited about that desk business there. Um, we're um, going to be, um, the tough part is, is keeping the sensor cool. The, sen the sensor, the IR sensor wants to be very cold to get good results. There's a nice thing by Tails, Thales, Tails, Thales, however you pronounce that aerospace, which is called an LPT cooler, which we found that can do this job quite well with um, very reasonably low power. And um, the RI cam, that is this infrared camera, is gonna be really sensitive really sensitive, even though we all have a fairly small aperture. Um, it has, um, we chose a short cutoff, a 1.7 micron cutoff to cut off all the thermal background. Uh, we have a Leo stop and these nice baffles um, to give us a good design and no internal background, and a big wide band that goes from 6,000 angstroms to, two, to almost to two microns. This is really the way to win, okay? Wide band, low space background. You have a steep object that's bright in the infrared. This is the way to get, to get um, faint. Okay, so I have some um, very optimistic sensitivity estimates here. If you look, if we can expose, continue our exposure up to 100 seconds, which is not clear depending on the pointing, but we could get way down here. This, these are equivalent V magnitudes assuming a constant slope, way down past 20 magnitude in these, in these very rapid exposures. Um, why, is, why do I claim this is so sensitive? when you know, Swift did all this work to try and make a sensitive camera and all this. Two reasons. 
One is that Swift has a terribly antique detector, which is in the wrong wave band. It's, a, it's a, basically a UV um, blue sensitive detector, and it's a very old technology. And second of all, um, Mercad Tel devices, they just kick you know what. This is the efficiency of the MCP, the microchannel plate on Swift. Look at the efficiency curve of, of Mercad Tel. Okay? All 80, above 80% all the way from 5,000 to 2 microns. Um, we actually do have a plan on, uh, on UFO, and I'm not sure whether this is per completely implemented yet or not, to transmit immediate alerts via Global Star. We don't have TDRS access, but we have this, this Global Star system, which basically means that we take a chip that has a cell phone in it and we stick it in the camera. This is Nikol Nikolai Vendenkin did this for us, and we're going to actually be able to get out alerts. And so I hope that all of you who have access to optical will be able to follow up on these. Um, uh, we do have already have our uh, col colleague uh, Alberto Castro-Tirado um, with his booties network. It's going to be following up. Um, we'll be on the GCN, and we hope you'll follow up with us. Um, we're giving um, optimistic estimates like uh, like we're going to be detecting 15 um, in the optical blue channel and about 29 in the infrared channel. We get a number like this that's, that's so impressive, even with a relatively small number of CGRBs, because we'll get every, every one, no matter how extinguished, we'll get almost all of them, even the fairly extinguished ones, because we're going all the way out to 1.7 microns. We'll be on it very fast, and I, I insist on putting a greater than symbol here because a lot of these bursts we expect to be brighter very early from prompt optical. And also the high redshift. I'm sorry? Also the high redshift of the infrared camera. I'm not counting on that one. These, these, numbers, these numbers come from not assuming that it'll be brighter earlier. These numbers come from, come from the same statistics as SWIFT, just, just saying how, how many do they actually get an optical candidate from uh, in each brightness bin. That's where I got those numbers from. But I think, it's, I think it's going to be a larger, it has potential to be a larger number is, is the right way to say this. So here's what I'm, so I'm going to do something absolutely awful and terrible that I should never do. I'm just making up data to show something potentially cool. Um, this, is the current, um, this is the current detection time histogram. These are detections in, in blue here. Wouldn't it be cool if instead of starting in 100 seconds, the detection histogram had bumps in, at 10 seconds one second, and even fractions of seconds. That's what we're looking for. Uh, so the last thing I have to say, I, I think I've just gone over this to death. I'm not, not even going to uh, go through the summary again, uh, although I just wanted to mention we, we have possibilities of, um, of, of getting a sample, a large statistical sample of rise phase light curves, uh, some uh, sub-second measurements, um, bulk Lorentz factors, rise times, X-ray optical correlations, possible multi-messenger measurements from this kind of high time, high fast response system. Uh, and and, with it, and um, I think I just want to mention that all our projects are open to follow up and other kinds of collaborations. Um, I really want to close by mentioning um, that this is not my work um, at all, um, except in part, um, our, uh, the actual UFO project, PI is ILPARC, um, and we have lots of people working very hard at the RCMST in Seoul. We have been ha having lots of uh, cooperation and help from people here at MSU and SNP, um, including Sergey, who's, who's here, and Professor Panasuk, I think he's gone. Um, and um, I also want to mention uh, lots of help from uh, George and the IEU. And I'm just going to close with our movie of Exercising Our Mirror. And I'll, I'll take any questions.